Uh, hello, uh, welcome. My name is Kelsey and I'm the producer of this production. My name is Margot and I've been the director. Uh, and yes, this is uh, Lust's version of Dreamplay by August Strimbeyer. Uh, Lust is Lundstun Theater. You can always get involved in our activities. We're completely open to new or old members uh, coming in and having fun with us. Uh, if you want to know how to get in contact, you can either leave a message on our social medias or send an email to info at lundstuntheater.sa. Uh, just during this production, I'd like you to just take a minute just to familiarize yourselves with the fire exits. And um, I will pass it over to Margot to tell you a bit more about the show. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, well, this semester has been a struggle to be able to work creatively in a group, but we've chosen to set up a dream play by August Strindberg, and we hope you'll enjoy the results. Uh, for some background, uh, August Strindberg is a Swedish playwright who was born 1849 in Stockholm, Sweden, but a fun fact is that he lived for a short amount of time in Lund. Uh, so this particular play, a dream play, or Drömspel in Swedish, was released in 1902 and had its world premiere in 1907 at the Swedish theater. We chose this play because it is written in a way to resemble a dream and we would hope it would fit the format that we will entirely produce, direct and act at a distance. And uh, as August, August Strindberg himself stated in the preface, the disconnect but apparently logical form of a dream, everything can happen, everything is possible and likely. Enjoy. Where are you, daughter? Where? Here, father. Here. You've lost your way, my child. Beware. You sink. How did you get there? What do you see, my child? I see... Oh, how beautiful! With green forest, white peaks and yellow fields. But what sort of race is dwelling there? See for yourself. What you hear is the speech of humanity. But it sounds as if it has no happy ring. Even their mother tongue is named complaint. A race most hard to please and thankless are the dwellers on the earth. You are judging them too harshly. This end. And see and hear for yourself. Return and let me know of their complaints. Well then, I'll go. But father, won't you come with me? No. I cannot breathe alone. Take courage, child. A trial, that is all. And so I will go.
council over there is growing higher and higher. Do you see how much it's grown since last year? I have never seen this castle before. I never heard of a castle that grew. Do you but... know who's in there? I've known it, but cannot remember. I believe there is a prisoner being kept in there. And he must be waiting for me to set him free. And what is he to pay for it? One does not bargain about one's duty. Let us go in. <sighs> yes, let us go in. You are imprisoned in your own room. I have come to set you free. You are a child of heaven. So are you. Why must I then keep horses, tent stable, and cart straw? So that you may long to get away from here. I, I have been waiting for you, but I was not sure that you were willing to do it. The castle is strong. But it can be done. Do you want it or not? Frankly speaking, I, I cannot tell. For in either case, I shall suffer pain. Every joy that life brings has to be paid for in twice its measure of sorrow. If I should buy the sweets of freedom, then I will have to suffer twice as much. You feel yourself wronged by life? Yes, it has been unjust. Who is that girl? It, it is Agnes. Oh, is that Agnes? Do you know what they say? They say that she is the daughter of the god Indra, who asked leave to descend to earth in order to learn of man's conditions. Oh, but don't say anything about it. Child of the gods, indeed. Is it true what they say? Child, you're wearing nothing but rags. Uh, here, take this robe. I, I hardly get the chance to use it anymore, and you're in far more need of it than I am. Are you going to lend my presents to the servant girl? Don't talk that way. Do you forget that I was a servant girl also? Why should you offend one who has done nothing? Why should you offend me, your husband? <laughs> oh, this life. If you try to do anything nice, there's always someone who finds it nasty. If you act kindly to one, hurts another. <sighs> this life. I feel sorry for humanity. You do? Yes. Life is hard, but perhaps love overcomes everything. You see the guard at the door? She belonged to the ballet. She was number one, but then he went. It's like her dancing went with him. And so she didn't get any more parts. Everyone here complains. With their eyes, at least. But with their words, also. I don't complain very much. Not now, since I have a fishing net and a green crab cage. And that makes you happy. Oh, I'm so happy. So it was a dream of my youth, and now it's come true. Of course, I've grown to be 50 years. 50 years? For a fishing net and a crab cage? A green crab cage, mind you. Green. I shall sit here and watch the human children in her place. This is the last day. The house will be closed up for the season. This is the day when they, found, when they learn whether their contracts are to be renewed. And those who don't get their contracts to renew? <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. Poor human creatures. Look. Here comes one. She's not one of the chosen. See how she cries. I feel sorry for humanity. But look at this one. That's the way a happy person looks. Victoria! He's going to marry Miss Victoria. The carriage is waiting, dinner is set, and the wine is on ice. Mm. Permit me to embrace you, ladies. Victoria! I'm here! <laughs> 
my Victoria. Seven years I have been coming here. Look at the asphalt below and you will see the path worn by a faithful lover. Ah, oh, hooray, she is mine. <laughs> Victoria! Well, she is getting dressed, I, I suppose. There's the fishing net, I see. Everybody at the opera is crazy about fishing nets. Or rather, about fishes. Because fishes are dumb and can't sing. Victoria! Now she's fixing her hair. <laughs> Listen here, madam. Could I not go up and get my bride? Nobody's allowed inside. Seven years I have been coming here. Seven times 365 makes 2,555. And I have been looking at this door 2,555 times without ever discovering what's inside. Is there anybody within? Does anybody live here? I don't know. I've never seen it opened. It looks like a pantry door, which I saw once when four years old, when visiting with the maid on a Sunday afternoon. We called at several houses on other maids, but I could never get beyond the kitchen, anywhere. And I had to sit between a water barrel and a salt box. Victoria! Tell me, madam, could she have gone out any other way? No, there's no other way. Hmm. Well, then I shall see her here. Who is Miss Victoria? His sweetheart. I see. What she is to us and others matters nothing to him. And what she is to him, well, that alone is her true self. Has she not come out yet? Nope. But she will come. She will come. But, uh, come to think of it, perhaps I had better call off dinner after all. As it is late. Yes, I, I will do that. I shall attend to your duties, for I want to study men in life and see if things really are as bad as they say. Oh, but it won't do to fall asleep here. I never sleep, night or day. No sleep at night? Yes if you're able to get it, but only with the bell string tied around your waist, for there are night watchmen, and they need to be relieved every third hour. <laughs> but that's torture. So you think. But people like us are glad to get such a job, and if you only knew how envied I am. Envy? Envy for the tortured? Yes. But I can tell you what is harder than all the drudging and keeping awake at nights. Harder than the, the damp and the drought and the cold. It is to receive the confidences of all those unhappy people up there. They all come to me, why? Maybe they can read in the wrinkles of my face some runes carved from suffering and that invite confessions. Anyway, when the job grows too burdensome, call me and I shall relieve you. Goodbye. What can be done by you on not to surpass my strength? We shall see. But be kind to my poor friends and don't grow too tired with their complaints. Please, madam, may I sit down a little on this chair? Yes, sit down, friend. I am able to stand. If only I could get some sleep, then maybe I would feel a little better. 
This, this door has cost me so much pain. I wonder what is behind it. There must be something. Oh, now the rehearsals have begun. What is that? Light and dark? Light and dark? Night and day? Night and day. A merciful province has come to shorten your weight. Therefore, the days are flying in hot pursuit of the nights. There's the bill poster. Was the fishing any good? I should say so. The summer was hot and a little long. The net turned out pretty good, but not as I had expected. Not as I had expected. That is well said. Nothing was ever as I expected it to be. Because the thought is more than the deed. More than the thing. What is the matter with the fishing net? Matter? I don't know. If there was anything to matter with it, it just didn't turn out as I expected. And the pleasure of it was not so much after all. How did you expect it to be? How? Well, I couldn't exactly tell. I can tell you. You had expected it to be something it was not. It had to be green, but not that sort of green. You have it, madam. You understand it all, and that is why everybody goes to you with his words. If you would only listen to me a little also. Of course I will. Come in and tell me your troubles. H has she not come down yet? Not yet, but she will soon be here. Do you know what is behind this door, Bill Poster? No, I've never seen that door open yet. I'm going to get a locksmith to come and open it. Uh, is Miss Victoria gone? Oh, uh, no, she has not gone yet. Then I shall wait. She will be coming soon, don't you think? Oh, yes, I'm sure. Don't go away now, for I have sent word to the locksmith, and you will soon see what is behind that door. How awfully interesting would it be to see that door opened? That door there and the growing castle. Have you heard of the growing have castle? I, I have been a prisoner in it. Oh. Was it you? But why do they keep such a lot of horses in there? Because it's a stable castle, don't you know? <laughs> How stupid of me not to guess that. Has Miss Victoria gone yet? No, she has not. She never goes away. That is, because she loves me. See here, don't you go yet before the locksmith comes to open this door here. No. Is the door going to be opened? Well, that will be fun. I just wanted to answer the portress something. Is Miss Victoria gone yet? Ah, uh, not that I know of. Now, didn't I tell you that she was waiting for me? Now, don't go away, for soon this door is going to be opened. Which door? Uh, are you the locksmith? No, the locksmith had visitors. I'm the glazier. That should do just as well. Uh, yes, uh, of course, of course. Uh, locksmith, uh, glazier, uh, do your duty. <laughs> A moment. Like this does not come twice in a man's lifetime. For this, my friends, I ask that you please consider the past door. In the name of the law, I forbid the opening of that door. Oh, Lord. What, what a fuss there is any time anybody wants to do something new or great. But fear not, we will take this matter to court. Let us go to the lawyer. Then we shall see whether laws still hold right or not. Come on, let us go to the lawyer. Oh, 
I want it above all to take up your agonies. All the confidences you have heard about vice, slander, crime, abuse. Look at these walls. Does it not look as if the wallpaper itself has been soiled by every conceivable sin? Look at these documents into which I pour tales of wrong. Look at myself. No smiling man ever comes here. Nothing is to be seen here but angry glances, snarling lips, clenched fists. And everybody pours his anger, his envy, his suspicions upon me. Look, my hands are black, and no washing will clean them. See how they are chapped and bleeding. I can never wear my clothes more than a few days because they smell of other people's crimes. At time I have the place fumigated with sulfur, but it does not help. I dream of nothing but crimes. Just now I have a murder case in court. Oh, I can stand that. But do you know what's worse than anything else? That is to separate married people. Then it is as if something cried way down in the earth and up there in the sky, as if it cried treason against the primal force, against the source of all good, against love. And do you know, when reams of paper have been filled with mutual accusations, and at last a sympathetic person comes, takes one of the two apart, and asks, with a pinch of the ear or smile, the simple question, what have you really got against your husband or your wife? And he or she stands perplexed. They cannot give the cause. Once, I think a lettuce salad was the principal issue. Another time, it was just a word. Mostly, it is nothing at all. Men are to be pitied. They are. And what people are living on puzzles me. They marry on an income of 2,000 when they need 4,000. They borrow, of course. Everybody borrows. In some sort of happy-go-lucky fashion, by the skin of their teeth, they manage to pull through. And thus it continues to the end. When the estate is found to be bankrupt. Who pays for it at last? No one can tell. Men are to be pitied. Yes, that is the truth. What do you want? I just wanted to ask if Miss Victoria has gone yet. No, she is not. You can be certain of that. Is there going to be a funeral? No, it is graduation day. A number of degrees will be conferred, and I am going to be made a doctor of laws. Perhaps you would also like to be graduated and receive diploma. Yes, why not? That would be a diversion at least. Perhaps then we may begin upon this solemn function at once. But you had better go home and change your clothes. standing there. Have you received your diploma? No. I was not held worthy. Why? Because you have defended the poor? Obtained a respite for the condemned? Relieved the burden of the guilty? <sighs> Woe upon men. They're not angels, but I do feel sorry for them. Say nothing evil of men. For after all, it is my task to voice their side. Why do they strike their friends in the face? They know no better. Well, let us enlighten them then. Will you try, together with me? They do not accept enlightenment. This is certainly a crazy world. Just look at the four faculties here. The government, to which has fallen the task of preserving society, supports all four of them. Theology, the science of God, is constantly ridiculed by philosophy, which declares itself to be the sum of all wisdom. And medicine is always challenging philosophy, while refusing to even count theology as a science, reducing it to nothing more than mere superstition. Yet these are all ruled by a common academic council, whose sole reason of existence is to teach students respect for the university of all things. It is a bedlam, and woe unto he who first discovers his reason. Those who find out first are the theologians. As preparatory study, they take philosophy, which teaches them that theology is nonsense. Later, from theology, they learn that philosophy is nonsense. Madmen, 
I should say. And then there is jurisprudence, which serves all but the servants. Justice, which, when it wants to do right, so often becomes the undoing of men. Equity, which so often turns into iniquity. What a mess you have made of it, you man-children. Children indeed. And now, I will play for you. Where are we, sister? What do you hear? I hear drops falling. Those are the tears of mankind. What more do you hear? I hear sighing, whining, wailing. Hither the plaint of mortals has reached, but no farther. Why this wailing? Why this never-ending wailing? Is there then nothing in life to rejoice at? There is. What is most sweet and what is also most bitter? Love, wife and home, the highest and the lowest. May I try it? With me? With you. You know the rocks, the stumbling stones. Let us avoid them. I am so poor. What does that matter, if only we love each other? I have dislikes which may prove your likes. They can be adjusted. And if we tire of it? Well, then come the children, and with them a never-ending distraction. You. You will take me, poor and ugly, scorned and rejected? Yes. Let us unite our destinies. So be it then. I paste, I paste. You shut out all the air. You can't breathe. There's nothing left but this little crack. Too bad it, Christine. Heat is expensive. It feels like you're gluing my mouth shut. Is the child asleep? Yes. At last. All this crying is scaring away my clients. What could be done about it? Nothing. We shall have to get a bigger place. We have no money. Could I at least open the window in here? The air is suffocating. And all the warmth would escape, and we would be cold. It's terrible. Do I have to do the dishes outside? You have not the strength to do any chores, nor have I. And Christine shall paste. She must fill in every crack in the ceiling, in the floor, in the wall. I was prepared for poverty, but not for spill. Poverty is always relatively filthy. But this is worse than I could have imagined. We are not the worst off by far. Still have food, cabbage is cheap, nourishing, good to eat. If you like cabbage, I find it repulsive. Why didn't you say? Well, because I care for you. I thought I'd sacrifice my tastes for yours. Then I should sacrifice cabbage for you, for sacrifices must be mutual. What are we to eat then? Fish? Fish you hate fish. And it's expensive. This is harder than I thought. Yes, you see how hard it is. And our child, that was to become a link and a blessing, becomes our ruin. Dearest, I'm dying in this room. With its backyard view, with its baby cries and endless hours of sleeplessness. With those people outside, and their bickering, and incriminations, and accusations. I must die here. <sighs> My poor little flower. 
without light or air. Can you say there are those who are worse off? I belong with the envied ones in this town. You know, everything else might be born. If only I could have a little beauty in my home. I know you're thinking of flowers, and especially of heliotropes. But a plant has the same price as six quarts of milk or a bag of potatoes. I could easily go without food if I just had some flowers. There is a kind of beauty that costs nothing. The absence of a, from the home is greater than any other torture to a man with a sense for the beautiful. What was it? If I tell you, we'll get angry. You have promised not to get angry. We have promised... You think everything can be overcome, Agnes, except sharp tones. You think I've been sharp with you? Not yet. Well, come on now. Tell me. Well, when I come into a room, first I look at the curtains. If they hang like ropes or rags, then I leave soon. Next, I take a look at the chairs. If they line up straight against the wall, then I stay. Finally, I look at the candlesticks. If they point this way and that, and the whole house is askew, this, this is the kind of beauty, dear heart, that costs nothing. What's your tone, Axel? Pardon me, Agnes, but I have suffered as much from your lack of orderliness as you have suffered from dirt. And I have not tried to make things right for you get so angry as if I were reproaching you. Ah, then we better quit now. It is very difficult to be married. It's the hardest thing. One has to be a saint, I think. I think so, too. I fear, I fear I'll begin to hate you after this. But let us forget hatred. I promise not to criticize your cleaning. Oh, it is a torture to I shall eat cabbage, although it is agony to me. A life of common suffering, then. One's pleasure, the other's pain. That hurts to be pitied. You know, I read the other day. By the way, where is the newspaper? Which newspaper? Do I keep more than one? Well, smile now, and don't get angry. I use the newspaper to make the fire. Oh, why don't you smile? It, it, I burned it because it ridiculed what was holy to me. Which is unholy to me! I'm smiling. I'm smiling so that my wisdom can't show. I am to be nice and I am to swallow my own opinions and say yes to everything and cringe and dissemble. Ah, okay, that's it. Now I'm going to fix things until you get angry at me again. Agnes, this is simply impossible. Of course it is. Yet, yeah, must endure. Not for the sake of our promise, but for the sake of the child. You're right. For the sake of the child. Oh, oh, we must endure. And now, I must go out to my clients. Listen to them. How they howl with impatience to tear each other. Get each other fined and jailed. Lost souls. Poor, poor people. Oh, I miss pasting. I paste. I paste. Can I come in? By all means, seeing that you have your degree. <laughs> now all life belongs to me. Immortality, fame, all is mine. And what are you going to live on? Live on? You must have a home, clothes, food. Oh, th that will come. If only you can find somebody to love you. You don't say. You don't. Paste, Christine. Paste until they cannot breathe. I paste. I paste until they cannot breathe. Will you come with me now? At once. But where? To Fairhaven. There it is summer. There the sun is shining. There we will find youth, children, and singing, and dancing, and feasting, and frolicking. And I will go at once. Come! Now I go back to my first hell. This was the second and greater. Oh look, she's been dropping hairpins on the floor again. My Wardstrom, have you landed here? Yes, here I am. Is this Fairhaven? No, no, that is on the other side. 
This is Falstrad. Huh, then, then we have lost our way. We? Oh, oh. W won't you introduce me? No, that, that wouldn't do. That is Indra's own daughter. Indra's? I concluded that you're bound for a fancy ball this afternoon. Right you are. And I hope both of you will come along. Why, yes, for for I must say, this this place does not look very tempting. But what kind of people live here, anyhow? Uh, here you will find uh, the sick, and uh, over there, uh, the healthy. I am the master of quarantine. Uh, it is my job to keep the sick here. It's nothing but poor folk on this side, then, I suppose? No, my boy. It is here you will find the rich. Look at, look at that fellow on, on the rack. He has stuffed himself with pâté de foie gras and truffles and burgundy. He has a case of uh, knotted feet. And, and that one, who lies under the guillotine. Yes, he has swilled brandy so that his backbone must be put through the mangle. There is always something to miss. Oh, oh, look, it's the mayor, our schoolmate. Can you see that he is still enamored of that old spectre beside him? He does not notice that she has grown old, or ugly, and faithless, cruel. Why, that... that is love. And I couldn't have dreamt that a fickle fellow like him would prove capable of loving so deeply and earnestly. That is a mighty decent way of looking at it. I have been in love with Victoria myself. In fact, I am still waiting for her in the passageway. Oh, you are the fellow who is waiting in the passageway. I am the man. Well, have you got that door open yet? No, the case is still in court. The glazier uh, has mended all of the window panes in the castle, which has grown half a story higher. This has been a warm year. Well, you have had no heat comparing with what I have here. When we fumigate uh, cholera corpses, uh, we run it up to 140 degrees. Is the cholera going again? Don't you know that? Uh, of course, I know it. Uh, but I so often forget what I know. I often wish I could forget. Especially myself. Who is going there? Oh, a, a poet who's coming to have his mud bath. Why, he ought to be having light baths and air baths. Man was created by the god Qatar, out of clay on a potter's wheel. Out of clay does the sculptor create his more or less immortal masterpieces, which are mostly pure rot. Out of clay they make those utensils which are so indispensable. Such is the clay. When clay becomes fluid, it is called mud. That's my business. Lena! Lena, show yourself to Miss Agnes. She knew you ten years ago, when you were a young, happy, and, let us say, pretty girl. Behold how she looks now. Five children, drudgery, baby cries, hunger, ill-treatment. See how beauty has perished and joy vanished in the fulfillment of duties which should have brought the inner satisfaction, which makes each line in the face harmonious and fills the eye with a quiet glow. Stop that. Tell me your troubles. No, I dare not. <laughs> But then they will be made worse. Who could be so cruel? I dare not tell. For if I do, I shall be beaten. That is just what will happen. But I will speak. I will tell that justice is not always done. Agnes, daughter of the gods, do you hear the music and dancing on the hill over there? Well, it is Lena's sister who has come home from the city where she went astray. You understand? Uh, but Lena, who stayed at home has to carry slop pails and feed the pigs. There is rejoicing at home because a stray has returned back from the paths of evil. Not merely because she has come back. Bear that in mind. But then they should give a ball and bang it every night for the spotless burkin that has never strayed into paths of error. Yet they do nothing of the kind. When Lena has a free moment, she is sent to prayer meetings where she has to hear reproaches for not being perfect. Is this justice? Your question is so difficult because there are many unforeseen cases and... It's like the stories of the old kings sitting on their thrones and from its height they could never make out what happened below. 
And then, one fine day, they disguised themselves and descended unobserved among the crowds to find out what kind of justice they were getting. I hope you don't mistake me for one of those old kings. Let us talk of something else. Here come visitors. Behold, perfect happiness, bliss without limits, young love rejoicing. My love, my bride, my light and my life. See the light that surrounds them. Hear how the air is ringing with music. It is Victoria, or rather his Victoria. My own is still mine, but, but nobody can see her. Here yeah, everyone must stop, who hails from plagues stricken places. Woe to us! What have we done? It is not necessary to have done anything to encounter lives and fairness. So short-lived our joy and happiness. How long do we have to stay here? Forty days and nights. Then I'd rather go back in the water. I would not live here among the poor and dirty. Now I set this all for going. Will you please uh, step in? Oh, my blue dress will fade. And become white. That will please you. No, it will not. Of course, your happiness was the cause of my suffering. But it doesn't matter, for I am graduated and have obtained a position over there. And in the fall, I will be teaching school, teaching boys the same lessons that I was myself learned during my childhood and youth. The same lessons throughout my manhood and finally into my old age. What is two times two? How many times can four be evenly divided by two? Until I get a pension and can do nothing at all. Just wait around for meals and the newspapers until at last I am carted to the crematorium and burnt to ashes. Have you nobody here who is entitled to a pension? There is a pensioner now, waiting for himself to die. He's waiting for his breakfast now. No, I'm waiting for the newspaper, the morning paper. And he is only 54 years old. He may spend 25 more years waiting for meals and newspapers. Isn't it dreadful? Well, what is not dreadful? Tell me. Tell me. Nobody could answer that. How shall I have to teach boys that two times two is four? And that four, how many times four, can be evenly divided by two? And Victoria, whom I loved her, and therefore wished all the happiness in life can give, now she has her happiness, and the greatest one known to her, and, I, and for this reason I suffer. Do you think I can be happy when I see you suffering? How can you think it? Perhaps it'll soothe your pains to know that I am imprisoned here for 40 days and 40 nights. Tell me, does it soothe your pains? Yes. And no. How can I enjoy seeing you suffer? We ought to be pitied, all of us. Everlasting one, hear them! Life is evil! Matter to be pitied! No more toil, every day a holiday, everyone dressed up in their best, and music and dancing in the early morning. Why don't you go in and have a dance, girls? They're servants, don't you see? Oh, of course, of course. But why is Edith sitting there instead of dancing? Don't ask her. She has been sitting there for three hours without being asked for a dance. What a cruel form of amusement. Why don't you go in as I told you? Because I cannot throw myself at them. That I'm ugly, I know, and I know that nobody wants to dance with me. But 
I might be spared being reminded of it. My boy, can you tell me what is two times two? You must rise when I ask you a question. Two. Let me see. Uh, that makes two. Two. I see. You have not studied. Yes, I have, but. I know the answer, but I cannot tell. No, you want tell. to wriggle out of it, of course. You know it, but you cannot tell. It is dreadful that such a big boy lacks all ambition. Big boy? Well, yes, I am big. Bigger than all the other boys here. I... I, I, I am full grown. Why am I here? Uh, I have graduated. Uh, why am I then sitting here? Do I not have my doctor's degree? Certainly. But you are to sit here and mature. And you have to mature. Isn't that so? Yes, that is right. One must mature. Two times two makes two. And I can demonstrate this by analogy. If one times one is one, then consequently two times two must equal two. What applies in one case must also apply in another. Your conclusion is based on good logic. But your answer is wrong. What is logical cannot be wrong. Let us test it. If one divided by one is one, then two divided by two must also be two. Correct, according to analogy. But um, what is three times one? Three, of course. And consequently, three times two must also be three. No, that cannot be right. It, it, it cannot, or, or else. No, I am not mature yet. No, indeed, you are far from mature. But how long am I to sit here then? Here? How long? Do you believe that time and space exist? Well, suppose that time does exist, then uh, you should be able to say what time is. What is time? Time. I cannot tell, but I know what it is. Uh, consequently, I may also know what two times two is without being able to tell it. 
And teacher, can you tell what time is? Of course I can. Tell us then. Time. Let me see. While we are talking, time flies. Consequently, time is something that runs away while we talk. Right now, you are talking, teacher. And while you are talking, I run away. Therefore, I am time. That accords completely with the laws of logic. Then the laws of logic are silly. For, for Nils, who ran away, it cannot be time. So it seems. But if logic is silly, then all the world is silly. And the devil himself wouldn't stay here to teach you more silliness. Beware the swelled head, doctor. Call me captain. I, I am, if you please. I am an officer. And I cannot understand why I must be sitting here being scolded like a schoolboy. Because we were to mature. Just to think of it. Sitting among the schoolboys, although I am graduated. Well, why don't you go away? Heaven knows, go away. Why, that is no easy thing to do. I guess not. Just try. Is there not one happy person to be found in this paradise? Yes, there is a newly married couple. Just watch them. My joy has no limits, and I could not wish to die. Why die? Because the heart of happiness grows the seed of disaster. Happiness devours itself like a flame. It cannot burn forever, but it must go out sometime. Knowing disaster is coming, it destroys joy at the very hour of its culmination. Let us then die together. This moment. Die? All right. For I fear happiness, that cheat. fellow. He is the most envied mortal in this neighborhood. He, he is the owner of all these hundred or so Italian villas. He owns all these bays, straits, shores, forests, together with the fish in the water, and the birds in the air, and the, and the game in the woods. These thousands or so people are his tenants. The sun rises upon his sea and sets upon his land. Well, is he complaining also? Yes, and with right, for he cannot see. He is uh, blind. <laughs> the most envied of all. And now he has come to see this brig depart with his son on I cannot see, but I can hear. I hear the boats come ashore, the noises from the village. My son, my only child, is going to journey across the wide sea to foreign lands, and I can follow him only in my thought. Now I hear the clanking of the chain, and I hear the people weeping, <laughs> deserted and disconsolate. I once asked a child why the ocean is salt, and the child which had a father on a long trip across the sea answered immediately, the ocean is salt because the sailors keep weeping so many tears into it. And why do the sailors cry so much then? Because the sailors are always going away, replied the child. Why does man weep when he is sad? I asked at last. Because the glass in the eyes 
need washing from now on then, so that we can see clearly, said the child. Oh, see how they cry. Meat and part, part and meat, that is life. I met his mother and she went away from me. He was left to me and now he leaves me. But he won't come back. Who is speaking to me? I have heard that voice before. In my dreams, in my youth. In the early days of vacation. In the early years of my marriage. When my son was born. Every time life has smiled at me, I've heard that voice. Like a whisper. Like what I imagine the angels greeting must sound like. That is the truth. Now you have seen most of it. But you have yet to try the worst of it. What could be worse than all of this? Repetition, recurrence, to retrace one's own steps, to go back to the task once complete. Come. Where? Your duties. What does that mean? It means everything that must that is unpleasant, repulsive, painful. Are there no pleasant duties? They are pleasant when they are finished. Once they have ceased to exist. Duties are then something unpleasant. What is pleasant then? What is pleasant is sin. Sin? Something that must be punished. If I have had a pleasant day or night, then the next day I suffer infernal pangs, the bad consciousness the next day. How strange. I wake up with a headache, and then the repetitions begin, but so that everything becomes perverted. What was the night before, pretty, agreeable, witty, the memory presents the morning after as ugly, distasteful, stupid. All pleasure seems to decay and all joy goes to ruin. What men call success soon serves as a basis for their next failure. My own successes have brought ruin upon me, for men view the successes of others with an instinctive dread. They view it unjust that fate should favor any one man, and, in seeking to restore balance, place rocks on the road. To have talent is to be in danger of one's life, for then they may soon starve. However, you must return to your duties at once, Return? To the cleaning, the cabbage pot, and the baby clothes? Exactly. We have a big wash today. We must wash the handkerchiefs. Oh, must I do it all over again? All life is nothing but doing things over again. Look at the teacher. Just yesterday he received his doctor's degree, was laureled, saluted, and now he is back in school, asking what is two times two, and we'll do so until he dies. However, you must return to your home. I should rather die. Die? That is not allowed. First of all, is a disgrace. So much so that even one's dead body receives insults. Second of all, one goes to hell. It is a mortal sin. It's not easy to be human. I will not go back with you to humiliation and dirt. No. I am longing for the heights from whence I came, but I will not return until I have seen what lies beyond that door, the secrets of mankind. It is my will that the door be opened. And you must retrace your steps, cover the road you have already traveled, and suffer all repetitions, recopies. May it come then. But first, I must go into the solitude and wilderness to recover my own soul. Follow me. What is that? Lost souls of foul strand. Why do they wail more loudly than usual today? Because the sun's shining today. Here, there is youth, sunlight, dancing. And it makes them feel their own suffering more keenly. We must set them free. Try it. Once the Savior appeared and he was nailed to a cross. By whom? By all the right-minded. Who are all the right-minded? 
Do you not know the right-minded? Then you must become acquainted with them. Are they the ones that prevented your graduation? Yes. This looks like paradise. <sighs> this is hell. It's 120 degrees in the shadow. Let's have a bath. The police won't let us. No bathing here. Can, can we not pick some fruit from that tree? Well, then the police would get after us. But there is not a thing I can do in this heat. I'll just chuck the job. Then the police will get you for sure. And you wouldn't have anything to eat, anyhow. Least nothing to eat? We, who work hardest, get the least food. And the rich, who do nothing, get most. What does the daughter of the gods have to say about this? I can say nothing at all. But what have you done to make your lot so hard? What have we done? We have been born of poor. Maybe we've been punished a few times. Punished? Yes, the unpunished. Hang out in the casino, up there. And they dine on eight courses with wine. Can this be true? On the whole, yes. Do you mean to say that every man at some point has deserved to go to prison? Yes. You too? Yeah. Is it true that the poor are not allowed to swim in the sea? Yeah, not even with their clothes on. But can't they just go out into the country? And find a pond or a lake to swim in there? There is no such thing. All the land is fenced off. But I mean like the free, the open country. <laughs> that does not exist. Even the sea. The great, vast sea. Even that. One cannot even sail a boat anywhere without having it put down in writing and charged for. Oh, it is lovely. This is not paradise. I should say not. Why don't men do something to improve their lot? They try, of course. But all the improvers are in prison, or the madhouse. Who puts them in prison? All the right-minded. All the most respectable. Then who puts them in the madhouse? Their own despair, when they grasp the hopelessness of their efforts. Has the thought never occurred to anybody that for secret reasons, things are the way they are? Yes. Those who are most well-off think it so. And yet we, the poor, are the foundation of society. If coal is not unloaded, the light will go out in the streets and shops and homes. And then darkness and cold will descend upon you. And therefore, we have to sweat as in hell. And what do you do for us in return? Help them. I understand that conditions are not the same for everybody, but why must they differ so vastly? Will you come and play a game with us? No, I must take a walk, so I can eat some dinner. So that he can eat something? So that he can eat? They cannot bear to look at us. Yes, it is all very wrong. And men are not so very bad, but... But? But the government. This is not paradise. No, no. Hell. hell! That's, That's what, what it is. is. Where are you leaving me? Far away from the noise and the lament of the men and children. To the utmost end of the ocean. To a cave that they named Indra's ear. Because it is the place where the king of the heavens is said to listen to the complaint of the mortals. What, in this place? Do you see how this cave is shaped like a shell? Do you know that your ear, too, is shaped like a shell? Have you not as a child held such a shell to your ear, and heard the ripple of your heart blood, the humming of the thoughts in your brain, the snapping of a thousand little worn-out threads in the sinews of your body. All that you hear in this small shell. Imagine that it might be heard in this big one. I hear nothing but the whispering of the wind. 
then I shall interpret it for you. Listen, the wail of the winds. Born beneath the clouds of heaven, driven we were by the lightnings of Indra down to the sand-covered earth. Dust from the high roads, smoke from the cities, fumes from cellars and kitchens, all we endured. Then to the open sea we fled, filling our lungs with air. Indra, Lord of the heavens, hear us. Unclean is the earth, evil is life. Neither good nor bad can men be deemed. As they can, they live one day at a time. Sons of dust, through dust they journey. Born out of dust, to dust they return. Dusty they grow. Lies the fault then with them, or with thee? Thus I heard it once, uh, before, when I was young. Hush, hush. The winds are still singing, but we, the winds that wander, we, the heir's offspring, heard as you have during gloom-filled fall nights, in chimneys, in pipes, in keyholes, and door cracks. It was we, offspring of the air, who learned to grieve the human breaths through which we passed. In sick rooms, on battlefields, but mostly where the newborn whimpered and wailed at the pain of living. It seems to me that I have already heard all of this before. Hush! Now the waves are singing. We, we waves that are walking the winds to rest. Green cradles, we waves. We, like flames of fire. What flames are we burning, extinguishing? Replenishing. We, we waves that are rocking the winds to rest. <sighs> False waves of faithlessness. Everything on earth that is not burned is drowned by these waves. Look at this. See what the sea has taken and spoiled. All that remains of this sunken ship are the figureheads. That's the ship which left Fairhaven, with the blind man some on board. It is gone then, and with it are gone the lover of Alice and the hopeless love of Edith. Blind man, Fairhaven. I must have been dreaming of that. The lover of Alice, the plain Edith. Sold her in carbonic acid, the graduation in the church, the lawyer's office, Victoria, the growing castle. All this I've been dreaming. It was in one of my poems. You know what poetry is, then? I know what dreaming is. But what is poetry? Well, not reality, but more like reality. Not dreaming, but Daylight dreaming. And the men think that we poets are only playing, that we pretend and play make believe. And fortunate it is, my friend, for otherwise the world would lie fallow for lack of care and action. Everyone would be stretched on his back, staring into the sky. No one would touch the flower spade, hammer a plane. And you say this, daughter of Indra, you who belong in part of there. You're right. Too long I have stayed down here. My thoughts have lost the power of flight. I'm sinking. I'm sinking. Help me! Father! Lord of the heavens! I cannot hear him hear his reply. I am earthbound. Are you planning on 
ascending the Asuvu. As soon as I have consigned this mortal shape to the flames, not even the waters of the ocean could cleanse me now. Why are you asking me this? I have a uh, prayer. Pray, 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 pray. What kind of prayer? A written supplication from an anarchy to the ruler of the universe, formulated by a dreamer. To be presented by whom? By Indra's daughter. Can I repeat what you have written? You can. Well then, by me it shall be spoken. Why must you be born in English? Why, O oh child, must you always wring your mother's heart with torture when you bring her maternal joy? The highest happiness that is known. Why, when you arrive to earth, do you give a cry of anger and of pain? Why not arrive smiling, child? Silence, rash one. Silence, rash one. Why should the work blame its maker? No one has yet solved life's riddle. Thus begins the human journey of roads of thorns and thistles. If it is a flower you covet, you are told it is another's. Every moment of enjoyment brings to someone else's sorrow. But your sorrow gladdens no one, for from sorrow not but sorrow springs. Thus you journey till you die, and your death brings others bread. Is this then what life is, what you have given us? Time of gods, can you interpret mankind's grievance in a language that immortals understand? I will. What do I see? A ship bearing down on the reef. What ship is that? The Flying Dutchman. Oh, that one. Why is he punished so? And why does he not go to seek harbor? Because he had six faithless wives. And for that he should be punished? Oh, yes. All the right minded condemned him. What a strange world, this. How then could he be free? Free? Oh, they take great care that none is set free. Why? Because, no, it's not the Dutchman. It's an ordinary ship in distress. See how the sea is rising. The waves are getting bigger. Soon we will be unable to leave this cave. Do you not wish to be set free? Yes, of course I wish it. Of course I wish it. But not just now. Not by water. And now they are crying aloud, and so is the sea, but no one gives them ear. Oh, who is coming there? Who walking on waters. There's only one who does that, and it is not Peter to the rock, for he sank like a stone. Can this be he? Is he the crucified? Why? Tell me, why again was he crucified? Because he wanted to set free. Who was it? I have forgotten. Who was it that crucified him? All the right minded. What a strange world. The sea is rising. Darkness is closing in upon us. The storm is growing. Has the Lord Chancellor arrived yet? Nope. And the Deans of Faculties? Nope. We'll call them at once then, for there is a door to be opened. Is it so very pressing? Yes, it is. For there is a suspicion that the solution to the world riddle is hidden behind that door. Call the Lord Chancellor and the Deans of Faculties. We must see this opened. 
And don't forget the glazier and his diamond. We'll need them too. Victoria! The young lady will be coming in a moment. Good. The uh, carriage is waiting, dinner is set, and the wine is on ice. <laughs> uh, permit me to embrace you, madam. Victoria! I'm here! Good. I am waiting. It, it seems to me that all of this has happened before. So it seems to me also. Perhaps I dreamt it. Or put it in a poem. Perhaps. Or put it in a poem. Then you know what poetry is. And I know what dreaming is. It seems as if we've said all this to each other before. In some other place. It is about the opening of that door, of course. What does the Dean of the Theological Faculty think of it? I do not think. I believe. I hold. I know. I doubt. Until I have evidence and witnesses. You think you like just try to use the facts don't care about your feelings, theology. Don't you do that? Well, what does theology believe? I believe that this door must not be opened because it hides dangerous truth. But truth is never what dangerous. Is what can be proved by two witnesses? Anything can be proved by two false witnesses. A truth is wisdom, and wisdom is knowledge. It's philosophy itself. Philosophy is the science of sciences, and knowledge of knowing, and all other sciences. Natural are science service. is the only true science, and philosophy is no science at all. It is nothing but empty speculation. Good. Uh, could you say? <laughs> and what are you then? You're the arch enemy of all knowledge. You're the very antithesis of knowledge. You are ignorance and good. obscuration. You cry good. Who cannot see beyond the length of your own nose in the magnifying glass? Who believes in nothing but your own unreliable senses? In your vision, for example, which could be far-sighted, near-sighted, blind, purblind, cross-blind, one-eyed, colour-blind, red-blind, blind, actually blind, getting to the roots of yes. 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 Here we go again! I'm not knowledge like, like, we're not actually living. Peace! One crow does not peck out the other's eye. If I had to choose between those two, theology and medicine, I should choose. Neither. And if I had to sit in judgment on the three of you, I should find all guilty. You cannot agree on a single point, and you never could. Let us get back to the case in court. What is your opinion, Lord Chancellor, as to this door and its opening? Opinion? Hmm. I have no opinion whatever. I am merely appointed by the government to see that you don't break each other's arms and legs. Opinion? Why, I take mighty good care to avoid anything of the kind. Uh, once I had one or two, but they were refuted at once. Opinions are always refuted by their opponents, of course. But perhaps we might um, open the door now, even with risk of finding some dangerous truths behind it. Truth. What is truth? What is truth? I, I am the truth and the lies. I am the science of science. I am the only exact science. I doubt. Oh, of course you doubt. Well, of if you even doubt. Doubt. Just, shame. just once. Yeah. Take shame. Lord Chancellor, as representative of the government, as head of the core of the instructors, you must prosecute this woman's offense. She has told you all to take shame, which is an insult, and she has, in a sneering, ironical sense, called you instructors of the young, which is slanderous speech. Oh, poor youth. She pities the young, which is to accuse us. Lord Chancellor, you must prosecute the offense. Yes, I accuse you. You in a body of sowing doubt and discord among the minds of the young. Listen to her. She herself is making the young question our authority, and then she charges us with sowing doubt. Is that not a criminal act? I ask all the right-minded. Yes, 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 it, it is, is very normal. All the right-minded here have condemned you. Leave in peace with your greed. Or else. My greed? Or else? What else? Else you will be stoned. Or crucified. Hooray! The door, the door is open. open! What was behind the door? I can see nothing. 
He cannot see anything. Of course he cannot. Deans of the faculties, what was behind that door? Nothing. That's the solution of the world riddle. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth out of nothing. Out of nothing comes nothing. Which is nothing. I doubt. And this is a case of deception. I appeal to all the right-minded. Who are the right-minded? Who can tell? Uh, frequently, all the right-minded consists of a singular person. Today, it is me and mine. Tomorrow, it's you and yours. To that position, you are appointed. Or rather, you appoint yourself to it. We have been deceived. Well, who has deceived you? The daughter! Will the daughter please tell us what she meant by having this door opened? No, friends. If I did, you would not believe me. Why then? There is nothing there. It is poppycock what she says. Poppycock! poppycock. They are to be pitied. Are you in earnest? I'm always in earnest. And all the right-minded, do you think they should be pitied also? Most of all, perhaps. And the four faculties? They also, and not in the least. Four hearts, four minds, and one body? Who made that monster? She, she has, has not answered. answered! Well, stone her then. I have answered. Oh, here she answers. So she answers. answers. Whether she answers or does not answer, stone her. Come now, prophet, and I shall tell you the riddle. But far away from here, where no one can hear us, no one can see us. Have you or... forgotten your duties? Oh, heavens no. But I have higher duties. And your child? My child? What of it? Your child is crying for you. A child? No, I am earthbound. And this pain in my breast, this anguish, what is it? Don't you know? No. It is remorse. Is that remorse? Yes. And it follows every neglected duty, every pleasure, even the most innocent, if innocent pleasures exist, which seems doubtful, and every suffering inflicted on one's fellow beings. And there is no remedy. Yes, but only one. It consists in doing your duty at once. You look a demon when you say that word duty. And when in my case, there are two. That friend acted as a tyrant. One first, then the other. The highest first. Therefore, you look after my child, and I shall do my duty. Your child suffers because it misses your void of honor. Infamous. It doesn't help that my conscience tells me that I have done right, because in the next moment it tells me that I have done wrong. <sighs> Such is life. Your child! Here are my children. By themselves, they are good, but when they come together, they quarrel and they turn into demons. Farewell. The hour is not distant when, with the help of the flames, I shall once more ascend to the ether. It is what you call to die, and what you approach in fear. Fear of the unknown. Which is known to you. Who knows it? All. Oh, why do you not believe your prophets? Prophets have always been disbelieved. Why is that so? And if God has spoken, why will men not believe them? His convincing power ought to be irresistible. Have you always doubted? No. I have had certainly many times. But after a while it passed away, like a dream when you wake up. It's not easy to be human. You see and admit it. I do. Listen, was it not Indra that once sent his sound down here to receive the complaints of mankind? Thus it happened. And how was he received? How did he fulfill his mission? To answer with another question. And if I may answer with another, was not man's position bettered by his visit to the earth? Answer truly.
Bernard? Yes, a little, a very little. But instead of asking questions, will you not tell the riddle? Yes, but to what use? You will not believe me. I shall believe in you. I can no longer answer. The altar is already adorned for the sacrifice. The flowers are laid guard, the candles are lit, there are white sheets in the window, spruce boughs have been brought to the gateway. First of all, I now shake the dust from my feet, the dirt and the clay. Perhaps then I should burn my roses at the same time, of which only the thorns now remain. My bills may go, but never the green crab cage. The diamond that opened the door! Goodbye! The minutes of the great process, hours spent learning and memorizing. My beauty, my sorrow. My plainness, my sorrow. I give my hand for my eye. It is my end. Farewell. Give us a parting word. No, I cannot. Do you believe that your words can express our thoughts? I am cast off by God and persecuted by man. I am deserted by the government and scorned by my colleagues. How am I to believe when nobody else believes? How am I to defend a God that does not defend his own? Poppycock! That's what that is. Do you think that all those who are tortured suffer? All those who die feel pain? Suffering is said to be a salvation, a death, a liberation. I paste, I paste, until there is nothing left to paste. And if heaven should split in twain, you would paste it together. Away! Are there no double windows in this castle? Not one, I tell you. Well, then I'll go. Parting hour has come. The end draws near. And now farewell, thou dreaming child of man. Farewell. And to thy fellow men make known that where I go I shall forget them not. And in thy name their grievance shall be placed before the throne. Farewell. <laughs>